thank y'all for coming. Welcome to La Dolce Vita Farm. Um, we are actually more of a ranch than a farm according to the county because we raise livestock and not really vegetables. Um, but we're small, pretty small scale. And so the challenges and what we really work a lot on is, is raising livestock sustainably on small acreage. And so that's like our big mission. How do we do this in arid, you know, country? Um, so we're starting here in this pasture. Yeah. Oh, and my name is Anna Claire Molazan. Um, my husband is Giovanni Tarmina. Um, he's watching the little guy right now. But um, we started this farm um, because we wanted to mainly have the lifestyle. It is not our first uh, foremost gig for financial stability in our life, but it's the way we wanted to live and the way we want to feed ourselves and the way we want to raise our children. And so we kind of started off with that as our main purpose. And then um, little by little, we have accumulated a small community of direct uh, market customers who return over and over again and then spread the word. And we, um, we are able to balance what we produce with what we sell. And so we can talk about marketing and that a little bit later. Um, but we direct market everything. So we have just a direct line to our customers. We always invite everybody to come out here, whoever wants to come and see how the animals are raised. We really uh, kind of pride ourselves on uh, having animals that are uh, kind of handle friendly, they're treated really well, they're happy. I've had people come out here and say, I've never seen a happy cow until I came out here. Um, <laughs> they jump around. And, um, and so uh, we came to it through that. So my, my husband's background, um, is from he grew up in Sicily and he his family has sheep and goats big lots of them um, they're a heritage breed from there and they graze up and down these really arid mountainsides um, and they produce lots of milk at the same time and uh, and then they always raised a pig or two or so on so he kind of grew up in that environment I was the city girl whose room was filled with horse posters and kitten posters. <laughs> and uh, all I wanted to do when I grew up was live on a farm and I wanted to be a veterinarian. From from, from, I'm from Louisiana, that's right, yeah, yes. And so I spent as much time as possible on, so I had cousins who were ranchers and farmers in South Louisiana, that's really my family heritage. But, but my particular family, we lived in town. So my parents let me spend as much time with my cousins as possible. It was really to be with horses for me. Um, but I got to observe a lot else, calving and like raising hogs and grind. I remember as a kid grinding corn by hand for the hogs and um, for my uncle. So I love those experiences and that's what further inspired me to want to do this when I, when I grew up. So um, a, a little bit more background. So I come from a background like education wise in humanities and, and the social sciences uh, and after I met Giovanni and we realized that this is the way we wanted to live our life um, I went back to school I was like I'm gonna go back and I want to be a veterinarian again <laughs> I'm gonna uh, pursue my childhood dream and on that track to go back to um, try to get into vet school I I was rerouted by influential great wonderful people at CSU that really listened to my desire and what I was maybe good at and and I ended up in the Department of Animal Sciences and I and I did a master's in animal sciences um, I was a little bit of a, a fish out of water there because they really focus a lot heavy on genetics and heavy on um, nutrition and and heavy on um, more confined livestock operations right um, and it's a great program but my my desire was really to learn more about how do we balance our livestock production with our natural resource base so I was more interested in the ecology and the grasses and the soil and so I, I finished that program but then I wanted to go further and so now I'm, I'm working on my PhD in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Sustainability um, at CSU and my research is really focused on um, looking at the relationship between cattle and well cattle and production objectives uh, with conservation objectives. So my research takes place on public lands 
um, and looking at how can we manage cattle in a way on our conservation lands that also can help us meet our conservation objectives but is not going to put the rancher out of business, right? So we're looking at producer livelihoods, um, so the economic side of things, and then um, but also what are we doing to the landscape and how do we sustain this for, for a long time. So, um, so I get to kind of practice what I preach here. So this is always a work in practice and you might feel that way about your own places. Um, you're learning every year and you're changing things up every year because you, because our, and every year is different, right? Environmentally, we deal, we're, we're at the mercy of the elements. So we have different temperature ranges and different precipitation and snow melt and access to water. And so, um, the weeds are different every year, right? So different weeds pop up different years based on, on the elements. So um, we are always shifting things around, and, but I feel like we're always doing things better, right? Every year we're, we're doing a little bit better than we did last year. So um, I think that's is that enough introduction. Yeah, <laughs> okay, so what we do here is definitely a rotational grazing uh, opportunity. So we're going to focus on sheep. So I'll try not to talk too much about, we also have horses and cattle and pigs, um, but I won't go into all of that today. We could do a multi-species um, farm tour another time, but we'll focus on sheep. Um, so sheep, um, <laughs> they like came on cue. Did. How did they do that? <laughs> um, so what we do is uh, we, we utilize, so our, our pasture like of this property stretches just down this rectangular corridor to that cross fence um, at the very end um, on the west side where you can see that gate kind of in the center mm -hmm. <laughs> and the horse is looking at us. Um, and, but then we luckily have earned um, you know, some r good relationships with our neighbors. So we actually manage this pasture and the one after that to the north um, where there's that black canopy. And then we manage um, the pasture where the sheep and cattle are grazing right now, which is a little to the south, and we'll walk over there in a little bit. Um, so what, what we do is we don't do, um, for the sheep, we're not gonna do extremely intensive grazing, but what we wanna do is rotate them in, in smaller um, spaces so that they have a little bit less ability to be selective grazers. So herb, herbivores, large herbivores, <clears throat> they are great at listening to their body. And so they seek out certain species and certain grasses for certain needs. Um, if they happen to be eating um, plants that have a certain level of toxicity, they'll seek out another plant to balance the toxicity of that plant. Um, a really great researcher who that has incredible information about um, selectivity, grazing selectivity, is um, out of Utah State, and I am Fred just, Provenza. Oh yeah, Provenza, I was like P, 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 um, Fred Provenza. So if you ever look up him in any of his work, um, he's great, and he does. A, he uses sheep a lot in his research. Um, so we want to provide them with enough of a land base that they can utilize their selectivity to give to give themselves the right nutrient balance. Um, but we also don't want them to have too much space that they only graze certain, like their ice cream, like their favorite plants, and then never graze the plants, the other plants, right? Um, and there's something called back grazing. So if you leave, horses do it a lot because they have teeth and they're able to do it. But um, sheep, if you put them in too large of an area, they'll only eat their favorite. And then instead of eating some of the other things, like what we would call weeds or whatever, they, they might, by the time they finish all going through the pasture and eating like their favorite stuff, by that time, the earlier grasses that they munched on are already regrowing, right? So they'll back graze on their favorite stuff again and just keep hammering those favorite species. So you want to find a balance between, um, you know, the size of the pasture, offering them enough nutrient diversity, but not allowing them to back graze and keep hammering the same plant species over and over again. Um, so where we are now, we, we call this the small pasture. And so it's this little L-shaped pasture around the pigs and it, it's our sacrificial pasture for the winter. So we feed hay in it, it gets hammered. 
And so every spring, this is the only pasture that we actually till. Um, we actually till it and we'll, we'll seed it with a cover crop. And so we just actually, we came back from five weeks in Italy and the cover crop was like up to here. So it's a mixture of brassicas and legumes. I think when you were here before it was like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a mixture of brassicas, legumes, um, grasses, mostly yeah, perennial grasses. But we have an issue here. If you look around, especially as, as you get closer to the irrigation ditch, you get more weeds. So the water from the irrigation ditches in the state, unfortunately, carry a lot of things from other, other places. So this pasture also catches that initial runoff from the irrigation ditch. And so we end up with a lot of weeds. We will not spray here. Um, but as you can see, like this is lamb's quarter. This is some thistle. Canada thistle, which we don't like to see at all, but it comes off the ditch. We can't get rid of it completely, but as you can see, it's been grazed because it's a small area. So if we gave them access to like this area plus where the horses are right now, they would probably not be very interested in this because they're finding better stuff out there. But since we close them in and we give them just a limited space, they will graze more of the the plants that we don't really like as much <laughs> and it helps to keep those plants from really taking over. Um, so this pasture gets hammered in the winter, we feed hay on it and then we, we reseed it. So, um, and we just grazed it just last week. So you can see if, if we had been here and hadn't been out of town, we would have grazed it earlier so they wouldn't have laid down so much. So um, with sheep, of course, we're talking about grazing management with sheep. We're not talking about sheep being on a dry lot, right? So there's a, the, the sheep are close to the ground and the optimal height of forage when you start grazing, um, you want it to be between like six to eight inches high for sheep. I mean, that's really optimal. That means that grass and those forbs are in the really nutritious um, green vegetative state. Once they start getting taller, they'll start um, producing more lignin, you know, more hard cellulose, and then they'll, they'll, they will seed out and they're tall and they're not as nutritious by that point. So the more mature, if the plant is allowed to get to the reproductive stage, which is when it starts to seed, um, you lose nutritional quality. There's more lignin in the plant as opposed to protein and sugars. So if you can keep your pasture and this is like the hardest thing I would say about managing sheep is you want to keep it short that's the best height for them and then you pull them off of it and let it regrow again and then bring them back on whenever you're working with multiple species that gets tricky because for example horses have their top and bottom teeth so sheep do not have top teeth um, they just have a, what's called a dental pad so when they graze they don't um, really bite they don't cut the grass they they rip it um, and the cows are the same they only have a dental pad so that's really important when you're thinking of how they graze you need um, whereas horses who have top and bottom teeth are able to get right at the soil surface and just cut all the grass down horses are super destructive and you have to keep them moving a lot or else they'll just decimate I mean, I'm sure you've seen horse pastures where they're like on dirt right they can do that easily. You have to keep those guys moving. Sheep can hang out a little bit longer. And so there's two rules of thumb that I like to look at when I think about, um, when I think about when is it time to move to the next pasture, right? And then we'll move on to talking about sheep themselves <laughs> as we kind of walk out there. Um, so there are two rules of thumb and I learned this in, uh, in school and I think that they are two great rules of thumb and whichever one seems easier for you, use that one. So there's one idea about take half, leave half. Maybe you've heard of that before. So basically you want to train your like rancher eye. So you want to be able to like look out over the pasture and you can look at this little paddock here as an example. If you look out over the pasture, if you knew what it looked like before, it was like all up to here. Um, but there is some variation because there are some plants that were lower and smaller and some that were taller. But if you look out and you think that they've taken about half the, the productivity, like half the biomass, um, they've taken half and I see about half left, okay, move them. Um, there's some ph philosophy, some thinkers and doers in this field that think that that's not, that's a little too conservative, that you want them to actually graze it a little bit further. And that's looking at um, wild animals like 
bison and um, like in Africa, looking at zebra and wildebeest and the way that they, they, they don't leave half, like they really mow it down, but they move on, they don't come back till next year. So here we wanna have multiple rotations in the same season. So um, another rule of thumb is to pull them off and rotate them to their new pasture when there's about four to six inches left average of stubble height. So you, you train your eye to look at look for stubble height. And let's walk over, can we go to walk over to this um, gate? Um, alfalfa that blows in from neighboring hay fields. So there's just a alfalfa here and there. And my lambs were just going from alfalfa to alfalfa, but the cattle were just going for those tall grasses. You know, so you can actually watch them, yeah, yeah pick and choose when, you, when they go to, into a new pasture. Yeah. Then they get, they have to be less choosy because they eat all their favorite stuff and then they have to kind of work down the totem pole. Um, but I wanted to walk down over here just to see, um, so it'll be just the, the last thing I say and then we'll walk over there. You can see that, you know, they left some grasses taller and ate some down. The sheep will be the ones to oh eat it. Did you plant field turnips? Yeah, oh so the God. brassicas, yeah. Huge. Yeah, so this year um, we weren't here for five weeks, and so we didn't irrigate when we would have irrigated. So all of our brassicas, turnips, and radishes are in here. Yeah. They didn't... I, I'm not seeing them yet um, coming up, but we planted this with the same. This year was a big year for lamb's quarter. It was, I don't yeah. know if it's like that for y'all. I was like, what in the world? Why is there so yeah. much lamb's quarter everywhere? Oh, but we like I said, but the sheep eat it and the cows actually will too. Um, so this is an example of a pasture that we got off of about a week ago. Um, the sheep and the cows are in here together. So you see that like the, this, there's a, if you kind of look across, so halfway down our field, we have a, an electric netting. I don't know if you can see that. Um, so we, they really only had half of this pasture, which is only about two acres. So that was about, so that was four cows and 21 sheep who had this um, for, it lasted them almost three weeks um this little pasture but you can see like if you kind of look across and if you walk around you can see that maybe they knocked down almost half or a little over half of the forage that was here mm -hmm. and then it was like okay let's move them because if you um knock down too much you have too much exposed bare ground and you deal with mo lack of moisture retention and all those other things mm -hmm. also um and then leaving some, um, leaving some grasses, especially towards the end of the summer, you're, you allow the animals to kind of have some stockpiled forage for the winter. Mm -hmm. The more you're able to save, so that's one reason why we stopped, uh, we, we cut this, we always cut the pasture in half, but we grazed the west end um, on both of these. You can see the line. Um, both this pasture and, and ours, we grazed the west end early in the season, but because there we we're having some issues with alkaline soils out there, you can't tell from here, but we decided to let it rest until next year. Mm -hmm. So it's like one thing we've never done. We've always, we always graze every piece more than once a season, but we figured that needed a little bit more rest this year. We'll see how it does next year. Coming at you live. The 1980s newscast. <laughs> I think I'm really perfect for this role. <laughs> I think you guys are going to regret giving me this thing. Um, okay, I have it a question. Looks so about, natural. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, I have a question about, so like with a lot of small acreage folks mm -hmm. that are just getting started especially, I feel like the pasture can get away from us really quickly, which mm -hmm. like pasture getting away from you means like you can't, you can't get to it in time before it seeds. And then like, especially a wet year like this year, we yeah. just could not didn't have enough sheep we, yeah like we we almost were saying to ourselves like we could have used a hundred sheep right for two months and then nothing at all like, yeah and then like down to our 10 sheep herd or flock so it's yeah like, so yeah how do you d deal with that like with grass getting away from you and how do you is it just a stocking issue or like you don't want to stock too much because then it might be a dry year. But right. Like, what do you do with these acres that have just seeded out tall? Because we've had years where we cut it and nothing came back. Yes, right. 
Oh, that's really tough. Yeah. So one thing, like going back to kind of like animal sciences and like ag economics. So one strategy is if you see it's a wet spring, you start buying like, pe like go to the auction mm -hmm. and, and buy some, buy like a crop of lambs mm -hmm. and get them out, you know, and then you sell them in the fall. Mm -hmm. So you're, you, you choose to have like more of a liquidatable mm -hmm operation so you and a lot of people do that with cattle they just they'll just buy stalkers um, like weaned calves mm -hmm. and then they'll stock them and then sell them right away gotcha. um, it's just a different way it's very businessy mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and yeah and and you have to work hard on a place you you know you're gonna be selling them because you don't want to have to feed them hay through the winter right mm -hmm. so you're just gonna graze them another idea is to lease your your land to another farmers um, herd or flock. Mm -hmm. So you're like, Hey, I've got like a, but anyone like posted or whatever, fine. Talk to people. Like we could have <laughs> leased <laughs> for our horses or yeah. something, you know, yeah. another thing is stockpiling. So if you can run, so if you can, um, do shorter, more intensive, um, rotations, so use electric netting, um, and make smaller pastures and push them through more intensively. It's a lot more work, mm -hmm. but that'll help everything from going to seed. Mm -hmm. So you can, so if we really wanted to manage really intensively, we could put them here because this was eaten in like less than a week and that was with cows. So if it was only the sheep here for like let's say a week and then give them about that much oh another week and another week so before everything at the end can really get seeded out all the way you've done a little bit everywhere mm -hmm. but there's also a thing i mean hay is so expensive right now that stockpiling so having your forage stockpiled um like we're we stockpiled the last half of both of these pastures this year because then that'll give the animals something to eat this winter in addition to hay and hopefully save us on hay um plus they want to graze like that's what they're bought that's what they they want that rhythm like i really believe that they look to like have that rhythm of grazing and then ruminating and then grazing and ruminating so if we stockpile then they can still go through the motions of grazing but you offer make sure in the winter because the quality of the grass is not as high when it's that mature and it's already senesced so you want to make sure and have mineral tubs we'll talk about that when we get over there um have mineral like a free choice mineral to balance the deficiency in the in the stockpiled forage so if you had um, so i guess that's kind of like three options in yeah a way. no that's good i think um so like if you had because I've heard about people stockpile foraging or stockpile like um, saving that grass for the winter, mm -hmm. and but they they had grazed it once, you know, once, like of course because yeah. they like had the perfect timing and everything. But like <laughs> I can't get to it in time at all. So like, right. would we essentially leave? Would you leave grass the entire season, let it seed out, and then graze on it the That's, next year? No, that 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 winter or oh. do you have to have an initial cuz like ideally I think a lot of people would say like an August grazing, let it grow back in the fall and then it's perfect for winter. So it's not too seedy, not it's not too, too Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, in the but for stockpiling, that's a whole different thing. So, I mean, that can be totally mature because when they don't oh. have any other option, they will eat it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you would keep it standing. They like will eat it. Yeah, I would. I think anytime you can avoid cutting ah. and like exposing ground, you know, bare ground, the better because that stockpiled forage is going to catch snow. Mm. Whereas if you had bush hogged it mm -hmm. or hate it, it's not, the snow is gonna drift off, right? Yeah. So like anytime you have like, I know it doesn't look as pretty, <laughs> it doesn't look as pretty, but when you have more of like a variation in height of your grasses and stuff, especially it'll retain mm -hmm. snow it, and your calves or your lambs will find wind blocks that they'll nestle behind like higher tufts and, and that. Um, I don't, I think that like if you leave, leave pasture ungrazed, unmanaged for like year after year, okay, that's not okay. Mm -hmm. But if you're gonna strategically stockpile and then put them out there in the winter and let them, they'll trample it, they'll lay on it, they'll eat it, mm -hmm. they'll just be a lot happier too because they, they really do wanna roam around and graze, you yeah. know? okay, that's super helpful.
Um, yeah, so we can, we can walk this way and go like kind of look at the sheep. Can I talk while we're walking or is that not a good idea? Okay, so I'll just talk a little bit about um, like sheep breeds. So I forgot, Taylor, what y'all raise. Um, like Dorper and Kipadon. Dorp. Okay. Um, so you have like three categories of sheep breeds. So you have meat breeds, dairy breeds, and um, wool breeds. And then those breeds over time and in various parts of the world, they've crossed them. So then you have like dual purpose breeds. So uh, we, have, we like working with a breed called Corydale. They're from uh, New Zealand. They are a crossbreed between um, English Lincoln, which is a meat breed, and Merino, which is the wool breed. So um, they produce a really nice quality wool. It's not considered fine quality. Corydale wool is considered medium um, fineness, so it's good for like hand spinning. It's a little more textured, um, but it's not fine. Um, then um, the, they also are larger sheep, so they produce um, really good lamb meat. Uh, so we had, I'll wait for the airplane to fly over. <laughs> so we, we used to work only with Corydale rams also. And recently we decided to make a choice to work with, um, to get a Rambouillet ram. You probably won't be able to hear me if I'm making a bunch of noise. Um, we recently decided to um, get a Rambouillet ram last year to increase, because Rambouillet is a fine quality wool. So we thought, well, if we cross him, and he's like registered really nice, if we cross him with the Corydales, it'll increase their wool quality. And um, so that was what we, we just tried it. We're like, let's see what happens if we cross Corydale with Rambouillet. So um, we've also had issues with rams in the past. So. Rams can be, you might have heard stories, super aggressive. You guys have a good ram that's yeah. more we, than one. We normally rent them or we'll like rent a ram. Buy, we did that the first year. Yeah, or we'll buy like buy bread ewes. Yeah. They're still so new. There you go. And like then the first year we just bought lambs. So, yeah. yeah, perfect. That's how you start. Yeah. We, we, our first year we, um, we rented a ram. Rent a ram. We called him Rambo. <laughs> And, um, Rambo. and he was a ram that we knew from the lady was not going to be aggressive and, and whatnot. We had, since then, we um, started, so our next ram, we, we saved one of our best ram lambs, and we didn't castrate him. And we let him grow up, and then we used him the next year. Um, and he, uh, so what I learned, y'all, have y'all heard of Temple Grandin? Okay, so Temple, we used to have offices next to each other, so I would talk to her all the time. What? <laughs> yeah, she's, she's like amazing. Oh. But um, she was interested in my research and I was interested in her. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. we would yeah. talk. <laughs> and so one day I was like, okay, please tell me what I need to do with this ram. <laughs> um, so what I learned from her, long story short, this ram had gotten super aggressive the older he got. And he like had knocked me, my husband, our neighbor's son who was helping one day, like to the ground. Um, started getting super protective of, his, of the ewes. And so she said that, so the first thing she asked me, she said, like, did you ever like pet this, lamp, this ram, mm -hmm. feed him by hand or from a bucket? And I was like, yeah, all of the above. <laughs> he was born on my farm. We like, <laughs> um, and so she said, that's the first thing you did wrong. She said, you rams from the moment they are born, if you know they're gonna be, a, you're gonna raise them up as a ram, you do not pay many attention because that's what rams will do to each other. Like if the boss is the one who like acts like you're nothing, right? So if we treated the ram, not like a baby, <laughs> and um, actually just were standoffish about him, like you do your thing, I'm here, you know, but I'm not gonna give you any, in Italian they say confidenza. I don't even know how you say that in English. Um, like you don't really bond with him, basically. You don't wanna rapport with him. You wanna just be standoffish with him. And that shows that you're the boss. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, that's great for our next ram, but what do we do with this one? And she was like, you have to show, you have to try to prove yeah. like bosshood over him. And so we tried that and she even, a lot gave us permission to be physical with the ram um, 
she said, or who will, who will like kill you one day or, or someone at your house. You know, they, they're very dangerous. They have so much power. Um, if you've ever seen a ram go to charge, and she explained this to me too, a ram will line up his, his forehead with his spine, whereas like a cow will go like this, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't have, so if you imagine like physics, which I'm not a, phys a physics <laughs> buff by any means, but it makes sense, right? So if all the force is in a straight line, it's like boom, but unlike a cow that will go like this. So a ram is actually more dangerous and more powerful than a cow. That, that's three times bigger. Um, the amount of force he's able to, to exude. So um, anyway, so we ended up actually selling that ram because he never accepted us as the boss. Um, and we had, we, it was too dangerous. So we found um, a really great place called You Bet Ranch up here in, in Loveland. E-W-E. Yeah, You <laughs> Bet. <laughs> yeah. And um, so we got, they raised registered Ramboulets, so just to know, and that a local place that I think they're wonderful. And so we picked out a young ram from them, and he has been the best. So, like, we can walk out there. Our old ram, like, held us hostage every time we tried to walk out into the pasture. Um, I had to, like, jump fences and climb gates, and yeah. um, you don't want that. So if you're going to raise up your own ram from lamb status, there's a way to do it the right way. Otherwise, let someone else do that part, and then you get a nice ram from someone else. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we have now. So, um, so we have our Corydale flock with our ram. The ram is able to cover um, up to like 30 ewes. So you really don't need more than one ram for a flock of 30 ewes. Um, sheep, a sheep flock will get out of control on you because they likely will have twins. So you have to <laughs> kind of keep things at, at tabs and I'll let y'all know when we get to the marketing thing how we do that and kind of keep things manageable and not let not end up with a hundred use after three years. Um, so this is our kind of congregational area. So every farm, right, every livestock operation needs a congregational area where you can catch doctor so this is a, obviously a cattle shoot we don't use that for the sheep where you have water um, we've tried in the past rotating water locations in order to not degradate an entire area like this we've tried re reseeding this corridor every year but it never worked we're just like this is our sacrificial congregational area and that's what it's going to be so we built this shed we can use it for shade we can put a tarp there in the winter to block wind and snow, and so they have an area here. Um, we string, that's a rub um, for the cows. They go under it, and we can use it for any kind of dust or like liquid insecticides or whatever if, if it gets bad, which it was earlier this year. Um, so um, the sheep have this location over here for the, and, and it's, sheep are really good at mentoring so like your older sheep are going to teach your younger sheep you don't have to do anything so we always keep around a couple of nice old ewes that are still lambing good they're really handle you know we can handle them and pet them and um and so we always keep our older you a couple older ewes around because they know the ropes and they teach the younger ones so this is where a lot of times they'll stay in the winter it's like Sheep need just three sides. They don't need four-sided enclosure or shelter. Three sides is fine, as long as the three sides are gonna at least block west and north if you're here on the Front Range, mm -hmm. right? Um, but other than that, they're totally fine, even as cold as it has been this last year and the year before, it got really cold a couple times. They were totally fine with just this amount of shelter. Um, we will also feed hay in those feeders um, in the winter so that they're not, the cows can be really pushy with hay and really butt the sheep um, out of the way. So we actually do have to feed some hay to the sheep here, make sure they're getting enough um, and not being bullied out of their hay by the cows. Um, so the chickens love, the really cool thing is that they'll be in here, they'll lay in there at night, they'll poop in there. And then the chickens come in in the morning and like scratch it all up and they like rebed it for us. Mm -hmm. So the chickens are actually great to have, um, or I would say your, your congregational area is great to have where the chickens are gonna be roaming a lot um, because the chickens really help stir up and scratch up all the manure. They'll, they'll get your bedding stirred up over there. Um, in the winter, we'll actually put straw down under there and things like that. And so the chickens really do a little chore for you. 
um, to some extent. I mean, at some point you have to strip it and rebed it. But so, can you explain how you like daily? Do you put them in at night, or do you no, keep them out at night? Yeah. So in the summer they don't use it. So we actually, what we do, um, we don't have to put them in. Oh, okay. Yeah. So to answer your question directly, we don't have to put them in. They just go. Oh. So this we had. Um, this is usually open. This is one of those, I think on your outline, there was like tricks, some um, little oh, tricks. Yeah. So my husband came up with this uh, fence stretcher. So this is usually attached here. Let's see if I can figure out how to do it. Um, sometimes I can't get it to work. This is like a broken fence stretcher, basically. <laughs> it's not gonna stay, but anyway, it kind of is like that. So we, we, we prop the door like that so the sheep can go back and forth, but the cows don't get in. Uh. Because the cows will just make a big mess. Yeah, and break stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the way it's kind of set up for the winter. In the summer, they sleep kind of out. Um, and then I'll show you, we have another shelter over here. So having, with the multiple species, we need multiple shelters. But this would be fine. I mean, this is plenty. We've had up to 30 sheep before, and this is fine for them to kind of all cuddle and just have the nighttime and be fed. Um, so yeah, that's our trick uh, gate. If anyone can think of a better uh, solution, let me know. <laughs> but so, to keep the cows out, but let the sheep go in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. oh yeah, sure. So um, when you, so it sounds like you're saying just so that folks can understand how they would re yeah. replicate this without it all set up already. Right. So you have an area, sacrifice area by the house or by, you know, the, your main headquarters. And I would say close to your chicken coop. Yes. Okay. So close <laughs> the to your chickens chicken coop. are good workers. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and then you have sort of a lane that you yeah. can. So then at the end of this lane, you can open up different paddocks. So then yes. you don't have to like. So that's a good idea because I feel like um, on, so at our farm, I have to kind of run a single strand and to yes. get them to where they're going, then they hang out there all day. Then yes. I open it and they all come back at night. But you're saying that you just keep this open. They just, just have open. the lane. They can come all the way back here and you're not worried about this this lane. You just, you know, it's going to get crappy and that's just We've tried so hard to not let it get crappy and yeah. it just does because yeah. it gets trafficked. Okay. Now, when we have them in um, pastures further away, we water them and give them and, and we do create um, a different kind of corridor to get over there. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is what we do too, okay. to get them to, our, uh, to the pastures way over there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's just like another conversation. I don't know if you want me to go into all that. Well, I think it's um, interesting because like we, we um, like you were saying with the older ewes, like we have um, one older sheep and he has taught them, he's, he's taught the like youngest lambs, like if you open a fence, there is going to be, there are going to be treats in here. Oh. So you could open it from like a mile away and they will run to the park. That's how our cow is. <laughs> yeah. So that's a cool trick that like, you know, people, they, you don't have like fences set up. You can just train them over and over and over yeah. again. In the winter um, is when we have more coyote action also. So in the summer, we don't have as much predation for the sheep and the lambs, but like March, April when we're lambing and there's the smell of like placenta and birth. And then we, we there's coyotes that live up at the, tra there's a train track way over there by those cottonwoods. And there's a den over there and they, they are more active in the early spring. And so we actually want the sheep to come, they, we don't want them sleeping out, mm -hmm. you know? So what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll feed hay in here. And so they just automatically will come in every night um, thinking maybe they'll get fed something. But yeah, it's just the routine. Yeah, and then the, like, like you said, like the older ones oh. really mentor the younger ones. Yeah. Um, this is a feeder that we'll pull out in the winter to feed hay. Sometimes we store our horse trailer here. Um, this is another shelter. Um, just as an example, so uh, we'll go back through here. This we kind of call the barnyard. That's where we store hay, we store equipment, we store tools. Um, the chicken coop is over there, so they kind of run out this way. And they really have free range of the whole farm, but if y'all might know that chickens don't have a huge radius. And so um, they, they go out where it, was, where it was really eaten down when we came through the small pasture. That was because the chickens... Mm -hmm. Um, keep hammering that little area, but this is just another this is another area that they have an option for for seeking shelter Whether it's from the heat or from the snow or the rain or whatever mm -hmm. um, 
And uh, so, yeah, giving them, a, I think if you only have sheep, you really just need like one and you're good. Um, dealing with multiple species is different. Sometimes we'll need the horses to have access to this if it's a really bad storm, so. Can you talk about fencing? Yeah, um, let's, look, let's go look at an example. So um, unlike cows or horses, a couple strands of barbed wire or electric fence is not going to keep sheep from being curious. Um, so this is called, um, this is called different things. These are called like field fence or like welded fence, but you want to have like squares. Um, and even still, sometimes the lambs will like push their head through and then get it stuck. Like they're, the lambs are <laughs> They are like super curious and they are troublemakers until they get big enough to not get themselves in trouble. They'll wedge themselves into spots and then not realize they can just walk backwards and get out. So <laughs> stuff like that happens all the time. Um, so welded, this is wrapped field fence as opposed to welded field fence, but you can also buy welded field fence, whatever. I think they're both equally fine and they're easy to just, you can use, um, have a luch. Um, you nails. You nails. I know a lot of tools in Italian because we started farming in Italy. So I, I know all the words in Italian and I sometimes forget the English. Um, so you can just use the you nails on, on wood post or you can just wrap, use um, uh, just m wire. Um, to get it to stay on T-post. It's pretty versatile. Um, the only issue is that is the bottom. So let's look. Well, here, here's a perfect example. So to get them, so what they'll sometimes do is if the grass is greener on the other side, they'll push under, right? And so if you take one thick piece of wire or like the bottom of your of your field fence and make sure it's stretched super tight on the layer of the soil like right on top of the soil um, that'll keep so like they can't really push that and get under there um, so for sheep the bottom of the fence is more important than the top I've I've never seen sheep jump like a three-foot fence cows yes um, <laughs> horses no not really our horses would never do that but um, but yeah, they'll, they're culprits of pushing under and they'll just keep doing that. So um, we don't have anything really fancy. So we have the top wire, just FYI, this is not currently, oh, unless my husband turned it back on. He might have turned it back on. It's an electric wire. Um, it's connected to a box inside the barn. But um, this is for cows to not lean over. So if you don't have an electric wire on top, cows will want to graze and they'll push down your fence. The sheep will pull your fence up. So <laughs> you have to like secure both. Yeah. Um, but this is not, you know, it's not super expensive. It's a lot of work to strand like T-posts, hammer, hammering in T-posts. And, um, but that'll keep your sheep safe. Um, and the electric wire on the top is also, will be handy for predators too. Do y'all have coyotes where y'all are? Yeah. So a coyote will jump a three foot fence, but if you have the electric wire, they can hear it. And I think they'll think twice about jump, trying to jump the fence. Yeah. Um, so you can feel the temperature difference under here um, compared to, to out. Sheep, you know, they're, they're covered in wool. The wool actually insulates them from the heat and the cold. So they're pretty tolerant of, um, of the weather here of our climate we shear every march so by so shearing in march what that does is it, it gives them the shortest wool you know in the hottest months and then in the winter they have the longest wool um, our particular sheep need to be sheared once a year otherwise they would just be too hot in the summer um, without being sheared because they really produce a lot of wool. Every fleece is close to 10 pounds on an adult sheep. Um, Can you talk about who you use for shearing and like how you, how that happens yeah. and like how you capture them? Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll show you, we do it inside the barn. So we, uh, we have a guy, uh, who's from Australia and, um, he's a super funny guy and he, his name is Scott Scott Mortimer. So if you're local, find Scott Mortimer. He's awesome. He's super quick. He charges per head and um, he wants though the sheep in a clean area because he's 
Um, he's been working with sheep his whole life, so you don't want the wool to get dirty unnecessarily. So you want the, he wants them on like plywood or concrete or something that's not mud and dirt or hay, um, because that's just more work to get the wool cleaned. Um, later, whoever has to process it. So we round, we actually herd all the sheep into the barn, and then we have a way of um, kind of getting one by one to into his hands mm. and head. And um, we bag up all the wool, and then um, I. Sorry, can you start that sentence over again? I'd yeah, again. we we bag uh, we bag up all of our wool, and one thing you want to know when you're picking your sheep breed is that. White wool sells for a higher price per pound than a colored wool. Yeah. It's easier to work with and dye and yeah, so we get less money per pound for the dark wool, um, but brown, the brown wool or the black wool is actually in the gene pool of the Corydales. Um, so it, it, it's a recessive trait, so we get more whites than darks, but still. Um, I think they're so cute, so I don't mind. It's fine. And and honestly, in this day and age, it's really hard to make money off the wool. Um, who who uses 100% wool? I mean, what clothes do you have on right now that are wool, right? Um, even in the winter, we have so many great synthetics. People use Gore-Tex and they use polypropylene, and right? And so um, the wool industry is suffering since World War II, really. Um, and what happens to the wool, if you can't market it to like a boutique, uh, like get it into a boutique market, like you can take it to the fair in Estes Park, there's a big wool festival, right? Um, or you can try to get con connected with the local weavers guild, there's a Boulder weavers guild, there's a Denver weavers guild, I think there's one up in Fort Collins. And if you can get direct market to more, more of a boutique um, marketing, <laughs> um, like chain, then that's, I think you can probably make more money or at least break even. But whenever you, so because I don't have time to do that right now, <laughs> um, you have to pick and choose <laughs> what you focus on. That was a funny rooster sound. Um, then what we do is, um, so we bring it to a guy in Fort Morgan who buys wool from like all around. And he collects it into, he, he pays you directly per pound. He puts it into what's called bales, and it's like this certain poundage, certain dimensions, big sacks. And then he sells it. Apparently, right now, the chain is he sells it to some place in Texas, and then from Texas, it goes to China. Wow. Yeah. So, wool from like Boulder County <laughs> is like going to China. Um, I mean, Weld County, I don't know if y'all know, but Weld County has the largest number of sheep on feed in the entire country. Weld County, um, feedlot, feedlot, lamb feed. Okay, so Weld County is uh, has the largest number of feed on of lambs on feed in the country, like the greatest number of head. Um, it there are huge lamb feedlots down there, like east of Fort Collins, basically. If you look, um, like in Windsor, like go east from there. Um, and I'll, while we're talking about that, there's nothing wrong being in the being in the Department of Animal Sciences taught me a lot about not being too opinionated about all the different types of agriculture. <laughs> because right now our world, and I'm just going to say like one little bitty thing about this, we're not certified organic. We do everything as natural as possible. We try to give the animals a way to live that's of their nature as best as possible. Even our pigs have, you know, a big space they can root and eat insects and worms and stuff. Um, but uh, the way that the world has developed around agriculture has like kind of locked us into this crazy system of production that is almost out of our hands, I really believe. And, and little by little, I think we're, more people are doing better and we're like trying to revolutionize it. But as the world sits today, we still need like those feedlot production operations too. Because that, because other parts of the world depend on what we export today, right? Like there are a lot of organizations that are working on that, um, and helping other places in the world be more independent and self self sufficient, self productive. But um, so, but what I can say about feeding lamb grain, so lamb that is fed grain tastes really different than lamb that is finished on grass or on hay. Um, it's the, probably the most distinct taste difference of like any other meat. 
Um, I mean, there is a difference if you eat grass-fed beef versus grain beef, but it's more of the texture, the flavor too, if you have a really good sense. Um, pork, you know, there's going to be a difference if your hogs are eating grass and not just eating soybeans, right, and corn. But lamb is a, makes a huge difference. And um, we are super happy and we love the, our lamb product. Um, it, it's delicious. And um, we know that they are super happy out here. Um, let's go, let's like walk that way. But yeah, um, and, and it sells itself. So we, we always run out of lamb. Like people, we have more parties interested in buying than we have lamb to sell. Um, <clears throat> so they've only been in this pasture for, I have to look at my the picture that I took. What was the date? It was last weekend, I think. I think like last Sunday. So they've been in, and this is only, we have it blocked with a field, with a electric netting. Um, so they only have access to half of this pasture. We can walk all the way out to where they are so y'all can see them. <laughs> we are here for the sheep. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> we, like never have well, any video there, footage. Yeah, they're just on. <laughs> they uh yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can see you can see about how much how how they graze, you know? Yeah. They um they leave about what is that like 2 inches, 3 inches mm -hmm. between the sheep and the cows. You won't see any more patches of alfalfa because the sheep probably already ate it all. Here was one. One of my like s private passions is like um, is knowing plant species. Yeah. I love knowing. I love being able to walk out here and knowing all of my plants. Um, so I work. I st study a lot to learn all my plants. Yeah, most of these. This is all smooth brome. So smooth brome is an introduced. I can like do a whole entire field day just about plant species. <laughs> Um, yeah, field brome is an introduced species. Um, this is western wheatgrass, so this is a native plant. It's like a little bit blue tint to it. You can see the seed heads are really different. I feel like they don't like it as much. It, when it's this, it's more mature. Okay. Yeah, they will eat it in the winter though. Okay. The horses will go around and just bite off the seeds. Well, yeah, because it's a wheatgrass. You know, yeah. It has like wheat. Yeah. Like, tiny yeah. yeah. They'll, they'll go for it. That, that's what I mean. Like if you kind of leave some standing and they'll go for it at different times. So here's a yucky patch of Canada thistle that you will see some of them eaten. And eventually if we leave them in here long enough, they will eat that Canada thistle. Um, the sheep are, are good about that. Canada thistle is really hard to control once it gets here. And So, um, so you see how we have the electric netting? So we have like a perimeter electric line and we can tie into it anywhere. So we can stretch a temporary fence um, and hook it into the electric fence from either side, from one side or, or the other. And that allows us to, I mean, we could have made the pasture as small or as large as we wanted. Just from experience, um, with the amount of labor we have available for pasture rotations, <laughs> about half the pasture is good. We can. This will probably last them another week. So maybe, by the look at of it, this has been a week. So maybe two more weeks max, and then we will open up that fence, and um, and let them. One good thing about sheep is that they, when they get used to pasture rotations, they know that there's something better behind the next fence you open and like they'll follow you like it's that our cows will do that too they'll see you about to move and open fence up and they're like yeah so they kind of leave this alone so they won't back they won't they still have to go back for water over there and that's one of the limitations always is where your water locations are we don't have a lot of options here because our only water source is in the barn and um, that's something you can apply for a grant for though like through the nrcs 
is um, to improve your water efficiency or your water conservation. So, um, but we always have to get them back to the congregational area for water. So what we'll do, instead of making an alley, because this many animals will decimate an alley, right? Like we'll end up sacrificing an entire alley. They'll turn it into mud by the end of the season. So instead of doing that, we open up the furthest portion later and they're so excited about the new half that they hardly stick around this half anymore. First, first of all, there's not gonna be much left. And second of all, they might nibble as they're walking, but they won't camp out here anymore because they're like super excited about the new stuff. And so that, that works pretty good. <clears throat> um, so these are our sheep. Sorry, yeah. Lambs will stick pretty close to their mamas. And one thing that Dr. Provenza has done a lot of research on is about the maternal mentoring of sheep and cattle. So the mamas will actually teach the lambs what to eat and what not to eat in the pasture. And the lambs, so if you can raise good mamas and, and mamas that become more and more familiar with your landscape, you know, their home, then they go and teach the lambs how to survive best in that location. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Um, so the brown, well, the, they're actually black. The wool's actually black, it's just the sun bleaches it, so it turns brown throughout the summer. But when they're first sheared, they're pretty, they're black. <laughs> the wool's black underneath. Um, but this is the ram, the biggest guy there. Um, we will, so let's start, go, yeah, he's big. So we'll start, let me, let me start kind of talking about the life cycle and we'll end up in the barn and talk about lambing, okay? But we talked about kind of the ram. Um, but the ram, so most sheep breeds, there are exceptions. I don't, I don't, I can't give you verbally a list of what sheep breeds are the exception, but most sheep breeds are, um, they only have one estrus a year. So that means they only go into heat one time a year and it's called a seasonal estrus. So their estrus, their, their cycle, is triggered by environmental cues. Um, for sheep, the strongest environmental cue is um, the, the decrease of, day, of daylight. So when we start getting shorter days, this is around August, September, definitely by October, your sheep are all cycling. Um, that is, that's why lambs are a sign of spring because their gestation is five to five and a half months. They're breeding in October, November, and then they're lambing in the spring. I mean, that, that's kind of what happens all over the place. So um, the ram, it depends on how much you want to control the breeding season. So in the past, we let the ram stay in with the sheep um, all the time. And so some sheep who started going into heat earlier, he would breed them like in August, and we would have lambs born in January. Um, which, of course, in January, you know what it's like around here sometimes in January. We don't want any frozen lambs, like surprise lambs. Um, so January, February, we used to just let them breed and lamb whenever. Then we started getting tired of lambs getting frostbite or hypothermia because we wouldn't find them. Or like for new mamas, sometimes new mamas aren't the best at attending to their lamb at first. They need a little encouragement because they're like, what just happened? Um, I mean, humans are like that too. <laughs> um, so, so I think that, um, you know, it's just more risky to, to lamb that early in the year. Same with calving. I mean, more, more and more ranchers are pushing calving into the warmer months. Um, so basically, um, if you push, if, if you separate your, your ram, like we will probably separate him really soon and we'll put him in one of our pig paddocks that we're not using. We have two pig paddocks. So he gets isolated. Um, and he's like, can't, he doesn't like it, but he has to stay by himself because we don't want him breeding anybody this early, whoever might go into heat early. But then October 1st, we put him in, and that's just what we prefer. You can choose. We prefer October 1st because that means we're gonna get lamb starting in March. And that's great because that's when grass is starting to grow. It's, it's more in sync with the natural cycle of, of the landscape here. So you're starting to get spring grass. The ewes are having really great options for nutrition during their really highly taxing late gestation. So the highest metabolic um, stress on any herbivore is late, the, the third trimester, they have trimest. So they only have like three stages of gestation and they're, yeah. 
same with humans. So their last trimester and then lactation. Early lactation can be really stressful for you. And when I go show you some of like our medical supplies that we keep on hand, I'll tell you about that. Um, so syncing their lambing with the natural resource base that you have, which means like spring grass is going to have the highest nutritional quality of the year, basically. Um, you, you sync that up. So uh, we'll, we'll start breeding and we'll put the ram back in with his ladies in October and he's like super excited. And in that time when he's isolated, we can actually control his diet a little bit more. You don't want the ram to be overweight. Um, it's called conditioning. So you want to, there's actually like a ram conditioning protocol that you would learn. Um, and we don't follow it exactly, but you want to give them plenty of shade, plenty of water, and you don't want to overfeed them or let them overeat. You want them to be in shape. He's going to, he has to be an athlete, mm -hmm. <laughs> like for, to cover like a flock, right? So um, that, that's what happens. So then, so we basically will put them all back together October and October 1st is our, our date. And then, um, then he gets to stay with them through about now, through about August 1st. We usually pull him out, but we, we had other stuff that's going on this today. Um, and, um, and then that's how everything starts. So he will just sense when he's going to heat, he will breed them. Um, in the meantime, all the lambs that you see, they're getting pretty big. There's a couple of little ones. They were some late, um, late lambing. So any use so basically a ram can start breeding even in when he was just born that previous spring they technically can start breeding a lot of people don't want to put that kind of pressure but they may end up if you leave them in with the flock they'll end up breeding some but you might not want to give them the responsibility of breeding everybody um, but by their by the time they're a year and a half old they are good to go i mean they can take care of a flock um, but what happens is some of your ewe lambs that were born in the spring, they might not go into estrus at all their first season, or they might go into estrus a little bit late. So if we put the ram in in October, we will have lambs starting in March, but we will also have, if depending on some of our ewe lambs that are first timers, we, they might not go into estrus until December, um, and that means May lambs. So we did have a couple of May lambs with our yearlings. For, that were lambed from our yearlings. Do you notice though, if you are, if you've got May, um, I've just heard some folks saying that it's easier on to keep those ewe lambs for an entire yep. year, some, or you know, or you've got that, you know, that that ewe is having a lamb in May, and now it has to try to catch up and have a lamb in, or get bred in October. Yeah, with everybody else. Yeah, that is something that some people do. So our shearer, um, he says sometimes he said, so he he taught us that if the ewe is not ready, she won't breed. Oh. So he kind of is of the philosophy, and this is when you have like a flock of 300 ewes. Yeah, you, what like, are you gonna do? Like you can't- If you have right, our sort, yeah. you know, if you have to sort all your ewe lambs off the flock and then find a place to put them for four months, that's just a lot more, right? So he is kind of of the philosophy that if they're not ready to breed, they won't breed. Um, and we've never had any problems. Really? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to keep going with that. But that is a, that is a, a real thing. Like some people really think that you shouldn't let your ewe lambs get bred their first season. Yeah, I've just seen like on another operation, just really small ewe lambs like oh. deal with like deal. You know. And maybe with smaller breeds. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys are pretty big. Yeah. Um, this pretty big, big flock. So <laughs> our neighbor's cow is like grooming my cow. She's like licking her over the fence. So sweet. <laughs> Cows are so sweet. Can you talk a little bit yeah. about, um, like, are there different sheep breeds oh, that do you want to repeat that? Can you talk a little about, about um, sheep breeds and are there ones that are better for this climate versus other locations? Yeah, I, I think that with, like, climate change, I think a lot of people, a lot of ranchers are looking at the reality of, like, heat-tolerant cattle and sheep, um, really. And so... Um, like hair sheep, if, if you look at other parts of the world, like in like South America or Africa and look at what breeds they're raising, those would be like the heat tolerant breeds. Um, I think y'all's cross is yeah, one of the, actually, yeah. Um, so yeah, we started, we originally did um, a milk breed from Scott Pilot, which was uh -huh. East Frisian. And those guys like, 
they were they were decent but I did notice like the wool did get a little bit heavy for yeah. them and, um but then yeah so we switched over to Dorper um there's pretty much three hair sheep breeds Dorper Katahdin and Royal White like that you'll find and honestly they're the bomb like I would I you don't have to worry them. about shearing you don't have to shear they they get this like thick hair coat in the winter and then you it doesn't even look like they have it but then once they shed you're like wow that's amazing that <laughs> I I didn't even notice but they have like chunks falling off and then they also tend to be a little bit more worm resistant. Um, depends on how like, the lineage and how much the previous owners were like taking care of that and culling when they needed to. Um, but honestly, they're they're awesome. And like I yeah I I can't recommend them enough because the the meat's also great. And yeah, so I think and I'm noticing in like regenerative grazing yeah. groups like Dorpers and Moving Katahdins towards, are like yeah. everyone's just like, oh, I just don't know if the wool like market is really worth it. Because yeah. you have to pay to get them sheared, That's right? That's true. Right. So and you then you're took, losing money every year. Right. Yeah. So but I forgot to say that. So the amount so each each fleece is about ten pounds of wool on an adult sheet. By by next March, these guys will have ten pounds of wool on them. Um the, the amount of money we make on that fleece is maybe like a dollar or two more than what we paid for that sheep to be sheared. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it just, just doesn't pan out. <laughs> yeah. If we had to start, a, I mean, we've been raising this flock. We've been working, we've been improving since 2011, mm -hmm. 10 years. So we're a little bit like, you know, sympathetic to these guys. And we really like the breed. They're healthy. We don't have to worm them at all, mm -hmm. but pasture rotations help with that because you break up the parasite cycle. Um, so uh, yeah, if we had to start all over again, if we like start all over again, we would do a hair breed. Yeah, Cause I think, I think that's where the industry. The, the industry is going and like with climate change and stuff, global yeah. warming, it just makes more sense. Yeah, I don't know about, I mean, they seem to be really, that they didn't need any problem they didn't need any help like lambing they didn't seem to like deal like they weren't suffering in the snow either um, and a lot of them are white so they were reflecting this like all summer they're just like in heaven they're just like <laughs> super cool i will say too I'm pretty sure that hair sheep go into estrus twice a year. Oh, okay. So uh, you do have to be careful and look up which breed you have because I have, we, we raised Katahdins at another ranch I was on and we accidentally bred way too early. Mm -hmm. And so, and then it just completely, some of them bred, some of them didn't. So then you're like lambing all year. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just the worst. And yeah, we can start walking back that way and I can show you all. Lambing is a big deal. It's the busiest season on the farm. That's that, by all means. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how we're doing on time. Oh, um, is yeah, beautiful. yeah, she's beautiful. Yeah, so Cal, I can just tell y'all. So she's a Piedmontese. She's the Italian beef breed. And this is her daughter crossed with Angus. Okay. So um, this is Fiona. She's the matriarch. She's like 11 years old, milk cow. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, hi. Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you did she's, that she's only two yeah. years old, this this black heifer. She'll be getting, uh, Fiona's like a big baby. <laughs> That's awesome. Hi, Fiona. <laughs> oh my gosh. Actually, oh my gosh. I need to take a picture of this. Yeah. Yeah. This is so funny. She's like, Natalie. Are you the star of the show? <laughs> Yeah, she she knows how to open up every gate on the farm, so we have to like reinforce every gate. Oh, I had turned off my phone. Will you take a picture? Yeah. My phone's off. Oh yeah. She coming up again. <laughs> Not anymore. So because my husband's from Italy, he wanted to stop raising Angus and want to raise the Italian beef breed, <laughs> which are big animals. I'm like, Giovanni, it's it's kind of like counter where like we should be going with this. But they are much finer quality beef. They, so they have a, a natural gene mutation um, caused by the myostatin gene, and it causes double muscling. So if you've ever seen, sometimes like PETA and like places will use pictures of double muscled cows and say it's steroids or whatever. It's just so not true. They're, it's actually a natural gene mutation, and these guys only have one copy of the gene. If you look at her rump, yeah, cows are so sweet to each other. Her rump has like a double muscled, you, wow. it's, yeah, her whole body is actually double muscled, but she only has one gene, one copy of the gene. If you see the bulls that have two copies of the gene, then they look like monsters. I mean, they look like, yeah, 
Um, but it's totally natural. And so what the beef industry has learned is if you select for the gene, then um, you actually produce a really beautiful beef product. It's actually um, way leaner um, and, and more tender because their muscling is not all used for movement. So they have another kind of like their double muscle is actually a non, what is it called in anatomy? Um, it's like a structural muscle. It's not a kinetic muscle so it, it's it's really like a it's like flabby <laughs> like it's not used for it's, it's not built because of movement or exercise so it's more tender yeah so the beef yeah <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah so the <laughs> so we'll breed um yeah all three of those girls are they all have cedars in them I don't know if you could see the thing sticking out the blue you yeah. see that the, that's called a cedar. It's a it's um it's a slow release hormone, and it's used to sink them. Um, it's a natural female hormone, but it just sinks their cycles. It's kind of like if a human goes to do IVF or something, and you have to get your cycle onto a schedule. So it gets all the cow. This is really common in the beef industry. Um, so it gets all your females onto the same schedule. And then um, you, so on Tuesday, we'll pull the cedars out and give them an injection of lutalice, which is another natural hormone that will um, basically like ask them to ovulate. Hmm. And then we'll put heat patches on their tail heads. And then as soon as, so cows mount each other when they're in heat. And so when the heat patches are scratched off, they're kind of like scratch tickets. Um, so when the heat patches are scratched off, then we, it's like, I call the guy and he's here and we AI him. Or if you wanted to use a bull, you would like get your bull in right away. Huh. Um, yeah. So, so that way you're calving. It's the same idea as oh, like totally. our sheep. Yeah. So if you're calving, if you can get your calving into a 30 day period, it is beautiful. Yeah. Same thing with lambing. If I can get all my ewes to lamb in 30 days, we're like in and out of the barn and we're like done with that stage, you know? Um, it's when it gets drawn out, it's really hard. I mean, it's so laborious and... Um... I think that's interesting though, like something that I've learned about the sheep breeding schedule is like, it's so nice to get it tight into tight, like yeah. one month, but then also... If it's you're, intense. If you're talking, yes, yeah, totally. It's yeah. really intense, but then also you're talking about if you're doing it on a very large scale, you want to be able to harvest lambs, yes. right? You like to be all ready. every month yeah. into the winter and almost into the spring. So right. like, you kind of want that. So like, like if you ever see like larger operations, they tend to have that spaced out for that reason. So they have something to harvest every single month and they don't have to just harvest like 500 <laughs> lambs in like one month and then have all this meat to sell, so. How, how often <laughs> He's do getting they come back? Of the like how, do you ever notice how, how often they come back? Yeah, them? they have, so like the basic grazing schedule for a ruminant animal, we didn't even talk about this yet. But uh, sheep and cattle are, are ruminants. Do y'all know about this already? Okay. For the most part, our okay. tends to know. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they need a certain amount of hours a day to rumin to literally ruminate and chew their cud. And um, so what what a healthy and this is also good to know because it's a sign of um, do they have ample forage? You know, if they don't have ample forage, they don't rest a lot or sufficiently. Um, if they have ample forage, they're getting their nutritional needs met, you'll see them take two huge breaks a day. Um, they'll, they'll get up early and they'll graze in the morning. They'll break through noon and like ruminate and then they'll come out again. Um, and then they'll lay down again at the end of the day. They might graze at night, maybe once or twice, but they'll usually have those two big grazing periods a day. If you see your cows like trying to eat like at noon or one o'clock in the afternoon then it's like mm, they're like missed they're not getting enough in the morning you know because by then they should be done mm. um, but if they're not getting enough they they won't allow themselves to rest mm -hmm. and that can be bad you know yeah. for their weight gain and their stress level and all of that i actually wanted to take a picture of y'all <laughs> <laughs> like okay. out it's your sheep yeah just y'all can just be walking. Sure. Okay. <laughs> no, no, you're good. Oh, what's he doing? Oh yeah, let's talk about the llama. Yeah. Um. So the llama is um. 
so she, she Ooh, so, cute. so we've we've opted for a llama as a sheep guardian as opposed to a dog um they eat less they drink less they're like totally self-sufficient and they're quiet, and they're quiet. <laughs> um and I've traveled in Peru and Bolivia, and I like thought llamas were so cool. I mean, they can, there, they just leave their llamas out with their sheep, and that's it, like not even a shepherd, not even a human, and they will protect the flock. So this is our second llama. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm just curious what they protect against. Is it just coyotes, or do you have other I've seen our llamas too? chase fox. I've seen them chase other dogs, and I've seen them chase coyotes. And actually, our first llama, this is our second llama, her name is Frida. We name all of our animals, by the way. So if you if you see all their tags, they all have actual names and not numbers. Um, our, our cows do too, but they, they have number tags. But um, our first llama, actually, I, I wish I had a video of it, but I watched her chase a coyote in the snow. I mean, it was like a, a documentary, like down the pasture. It was beautiful. And like there was this coyote like running out towards the west and the mountains are in the background and she was chasing it out the pasture. So she, so, but that llama actually died in the line of duty because our sheep were in our neighbor's pasture where that canopy is over there. And um, we went over there in the morning and she was like dismembered and we were not missing a single lamb. So she had like protected the flock probably against more than one coyote. I mean, there had to have been more than one coyote and they took her life and then it saved our sheep. Um, that was the last time we ever kept sheep over that way. It's just a little too open over there. And anyway, we had, we don't put the sheep over in that pasture anymore, but but that's what the llama would do. And this llama, um, she sticks really close to the sheep sometimes, but other times I see her just on the perimeters. Like she's just like walking the perimeters or she'll sit out and she'll always be facing that way um, because that's where they live. Um, but they, we, we have, as, as long as we've had a llama, they will naturally attach to the flock. It's just something about their, their relationship that they have. And um, they will naturally kind of assume that role. You don't have to train them. You don't have to do anything. You just put them with your sheep and they'll eventually get it. And I've actually, they can be babysitters for lambs. Like I've seen the sheep grazing when the lambs are really little and they're sleeping a lot. Um, they, will, they will sleep around her. Like they'll curl up. They'll like play on her back and jump off of her and stuff so it's really neat I, you, I would highly recommend a llama do I mean, you want I've heard a stories female of some llamas not assuming the role really well and i can't speak to that i'm not sure we haven't had that issue do you want a female llama or is it okay to have a male I, you can have a male so our neighbors had a great male llama they have goats the ones who have that dairy cow that's really good friends with our cow um so they have goats over there and they had a male llama named oreo and he was a really good llama and, um, and yeah, he was a male, so yeah. And they're not fancy llamas. I mean, they're, they're not even like, you won't even sell their wool. Like they're not that yeah. level. They don't have to be. Do you need to shear them? No. And they're a camelid. So they like are super efficient with water, super efficient with forage. Um, they will utilize the same. I'll show you our mineral tub. You don't have to have anything special. I will say too, I've, um, dogs, dogs work, but they're like, we tend to all be in like urban environments and just not working. And then, um, I also had a donkey, but the donkeys tended to founder on the, cause oh. we kept putting them on such great grass. Oh, that's interesting. So you have to like pay attention to if donkeys are kind of like rugged animals, like they yeah. cannot have good forage. Yeah. And so that's something to think about too. Like. I thought it was, I thought donkey was were awesome, but I did kind of figure out, first of all, he, he was like really lonely. And so he like kind of got depressed and then also like foundered. And so, yeah, yeah. I like the llama and idea. That's horses, awesome. Um, donkeys are, are well, <laughs> the horse, um, the donkeys will eat more. They okay. consume more food. That makes sense. And more of your forage or more of your hay than gotcha. a llama. Okay. That, by the way, manure pile. <laughs> So I always like tell people who, who want to like start a farm, I'm like, uh, like, I don't know, 40% of what you do is like poop management. Um, 
yep. you know, keeping things clean, especially when you have baby animals. I mean, we're constantly like taking the tractor and just kind of like leveling this and scooping out the congregational areas and um, back blading it or whatever to kind of keep it a, a tidy, you know, because you don't want them really laying on their poop. So um, when you have sheep, one really important thing about sheep, how did you, did you just jump the fence? Oh, okay. You can jump it. It's fine. Um, so they always need white salt lick. Um, and we don't often, they don't even hardly use this. So a veterinarian friend of mine is always like, don't use the, the, um, yeah, no, the block mineral. Um, she really recommended just for salt, just a white salt lick. Don't get the red one or anything like that. They just need the white salt one. And um, this, this has been here for like years and they just won't because we offer something better, yeah. um, which is what they're eating right now. Good. <laughs> yeah. so, so you're saying so, no, no loose mineral. Well, you do this and then a white salt block. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Um, really easy and we so in the past this is like some of those learning curves so in the past we um, we've had a couple of funny issues with lambs pop up that we didn't really know the cause except the vet thought it was some kind of deficiency like some lameness um, we had like a joint disease that he thought was also was mycoplasma that can set up in the joints but this is um it I'm not like trying to sell this particular brand because there's a bunch but this is a great, <laughs> these are two lambs. Like, oh my God, what's happening? <laughs> There's some taking shade over here. So sheep are very um, sensitive to copper toxicity. So if you have cattle and horses and sheep and they're sharing a mineral tub, you have to make sure and get an all species or a no copper mineral, whether it's a tub, like a lick like this, um, whether it's a tub or a loose mineral or a block or whatever, because if um, that's like ma a major, um, major caution that um, most minerals will automatically have copper because other species can handle it. But sheep will um, there. It'll be toxic for them. Too much copper. So you want to make sure and have an all species or it'll say like no copper or copper free mineral. But having a white salt block out plus a trace mineral tub. So like I was talking about earlier with their foraging behavior, they will come to this when they feel like they need it, you know, and you have to kind of trust that they're, bod that they're listening to their bodies. But you want to have a mineral free choice um, just to make sure, because you don't know like from year to year based on precipitation and your soil health and all of that, if they're really meeting all of those trace mineral needs. And a trace mineral deficiency can actually be problematic like for their health. Um, so ever since we start, so here's another thing. So talking about, let's like move from breeding. So we talked about breeding, move into gestation. So keeping your ewes healthy during gestation means you need to increase their, um, their cal caloric content, you know, just like humans. So what we used to do, okay, so first of all, when we first started, we didn't realize we needed to do that. And um, we had a lot of like twin lambs born where one was really little and one was big. And, um, and so I forgot how we learned, but someone was like, you should grain the ewes like the last trimester, which means feeding them some sweet grain um, once a day. So we did that for a couple of years. And what happened was we had huge lambs. Oh. We're like, oh no. So we were over conditioning our females. So they were getting too big um, during late gestation. Okay, step back again. <laughs> The lambs are too big. Let's do something different. So we found out about this particular, this is a Vitalix brand. We love it. And it, ever since we've been offering this free choice to our all of our animals, we have not had any issues. And our lambs are like, this. our last two lambing seasons since we started to use these, we have more multiples than before, and they are all great sizes. I mean, we've never had any, we haven't had any stillborns in two years. Um, they've just been, they've been great. And I, the only thing we've changed is that we offer this free choice. Um, and they will, they will utilize, it also has protein. So it's going to, so in the winter when the quality of their forage is less, 
they have they can get the makeup for their protein here and um yeah it worth the the money yeah we had an <laughs> issue with like all of our sheep getting pink eye chronically and i had to keep treating it keep treating it and it turns out i had the mineral in the night pen and i didn't have it like access accessible all day oh. and then i just like put the mineral out in the field and all of the pink eye went away yes. because they had like it was some deficiency yeah. that like their immune systems couldn't handle yes. that and so you'll see like really weird problems popping up and you're like what is happening what is that and yeah. it's just a mineral they need so many minerals yeah. so that's really cool that you use that thing we get we... it at murdoch okay. there's other brands too I think it does um, but have. I like this one. Like I've seen the ingredients. Sometimes they'll include grain byproducts and like mm -hmm. molasses. So sometimes if you're going for like a particular like grass fed certification, you might not be able to use that. <laughs> but in general, if you're not Those like going hurling. for some really fancy schmancy label, then you can yeah, yeah. go for it. Yeah. So in this case, the cows can eat it, and they can eat it. We have one out for the horses. <laughs> um, she's like, I can't, she's like, I can't fit. She's too big. <laughs> um. Okay, yeah, so mineral, uh, mineral, salt, yeah. And then otherwise, we 100% grass feed. Like, we don't grain anymore. Wow. We, so we, had, we were able to cut out graining the females in their late gestation. And, and um, we feed, uh, well, one thing that we do switch up in during late gestation, we feed a higher percentage alfalfa hay. Mm. So that is something we, and especially when they're lambing, they are getting almost straight alfalfa. So we save our best quality hay for lambing season. A couple of times we've had issues of ewes getting ketotic. Let's go in here and we'll look at all that stuff. So see how they are taking, they're using this for shade in here. Look how big that ram is. Yeah, those two, those are her twins. We had, yeah, we had three sets of triplets this, this spring. That's the most triplets we've ever had. And they raised them all up. Oh, yeah, that's cool. This is our old farm truck. <laughs> it's super fun. Yeah. Yeah, it drives great. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, we just don't have another a better place to store it. So this is like the barnyard. This is what we call the barnyard. It's like storage. It's the working area. So like we have yard equipment and some other equipment stored in there. We'll end up, we haven't started stocking up on hay yet this year, but we'll end up stacking all of our hay right here. Um, so this gets full like out to here. Um, of course the chickens, like if we have food scraps and weeds I pull from the garden, I'll throw it out here for the chickens and the ducks to eat. But um, this is just, you know, working area. Yep. <laughs> to me, it always looks messy, but I'm like, I don't even know how else to do it. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh my God. We're, we're all like my husband and I, and my parents actually, we're all kind of like over organizers. We're all kind of type A about that. So it's nice. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so here, I'll turn this, so I have this little like display for you guys. Oh, look at uh, this. <laughs> um, these are like the bare essentials, the bare necessities. All right, so um, speak to kind of bridging nutrition into lambing season. So you nutrition, so we have had wonderful results um, feeding the ewes higher quality hay in their gestation period, especially towards the end of gestation. So I'm talking like starting in February. Um, start giving them your highest quality hay that you've got stored. We try to get, which for us means more alfalfa, um, up to like straight alfalfa. Whereas earlier in the winter, their nutritional needs are a little bit less and we're feeding, you know, mix of grass and alfalfa or just grass hay. Um, if the ewes are not, um, if, they're, if their nutritional needs are not being met late, uh, late gestation, when they lamb, they expend so much energy and then they start lactating like crazy and it, they get thrown off metabolically. So they actually get ketotic, which means that they are starting to throw proteins. Um, they get very weak. And these little guys, this is something that people who are, are diabetic use, um, they're keto ketox strips. So you can get this at Walgreens. Um, so all you have to do, and this is the same for cows, because cows can get ketotic when they calve. 
it's just such a when they when they calf like so their body is producing like the biggest animal possible plus they're starting to lactate and it's just a huge stress on their metabolism um, so you just hold this under their urine basically um, and if it turns a certain color they're ketotic there's proteins in their urine so when that happens, um, usually by the time that happens, you, you need the vet. They usually need like um, glucose because they're, they're, not, they're not able to metabolize um, protein because they're lacking glucose. They're lacking sugars. Um, so they, um, you, we've had it to where like we've had the vet come and like literally drench them or give them an, a certain, like an IV mm -hmm. and just get glucose into them. Um, so you don't want that to happen. We have not had to deal with that in years because we've improved our, our um, nutrition, you know, and our protocol for during gestation. Like I said, with offering free choice mineral and giving them higher quality hay. Mm -hmm. um, Can you talk about like what constitutes higher quality hay? Like how you yes. would notice? So alfalfa is a legume. So that's why we saw, like I showed you, the lambs are eating that. They eat it all first. It, alfalfa has a higher quality protein like beans as opposed to like, um, I don't know, like kale. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll, so you'll, they're getting more protein from alfalfa. It's a, considered a higher nutritional quality because of the protein to fiber ratio. So a lot of people will test their hay. You can ask, some people will test their hay. You can actually ask to test hay before you buy it. And they'll put in a probe and they'll pull out a sample from the middle of the bale. And you can send it to the lab, like to CSU for analysis. And they'll tell you the nutritional quality. Some formulas will do that already. I, I know one who does that all, always, if <laughs> like you guys know. Yeah. Um, so higher alfalfa to grass is going to be a higher quality hay. Okay. If the alfalfa is cut at the right time, so um, alfalfa should be cut at the like what's called the pre-bloom stage, where it's just like barely like a purple haze over the pasture. Once it starts to get past that, you're way more further into the reproductive stage of the plant. So just like I was talking about with the grass, the, the more you get out of vegetative growth and into reproductive growth, you lose quality of the forage. So um, and regardless, alfalfa is going to have a higher protein content. So when I say higher quality hay, more alfalfa to straight alfalfa hay. So usually when you buy hay, it's like straight grass, straight alfalfa, and then some people grow an alfalfa grass mix. And we usually try to buy a little bit of everything. So then lambing. So then it gets really exciting. So when they get close to lambing, there's signs of them lambing. So they'll start to bag up. They'll start to get milk in their udder. Um, when they start to get really close to lambing, um, well, you see them, you can see like their hips, inside their hips starts to fill in. You can't, their hips aren't hollowed out anymore. Um, and then they'll start to act different. So they'll isolate themselves a little bit. They'll, they'll lay down when everyone else is still eating. Like they'll lay down more. Um, and then really they start to, they'll really start to isolate and then they'll start to actually nest and they'll like go like this wherever they decide they want to lamb. What we try to do is look for that and as soon as we see them nesting, um, we like throw them in the barn. Um, and this is the way that we found to save, to have the least problems um, with any, any complications, especially since March and April and May, it can still be really cold at night. It can be snowing. We don't want lambs freezing to death outside. So we, Giovanni and I set up this stall to show you an example of what we do to all of these stalls when we're lambing. Um, so we divide the stall in half um, so that we can put two U's in here because we end up needing it. <laughs> we end up need, needing the space in the hotel. Um, so we bed it with, we, we like wood shavings as opposed to straw. Um, it's easier to clean, easier, easier to muck out. And I, I just feel like it actually dries better. Um, we give them, they have, each have a water bucket. They each have a little pan to feed alfalfa in. Mm -hmm. By the time they're in here, they're getting fed straight alfalfa. Pellets or hay? No, yeah, hay. Hay, okay. Yeah, we don't do, pellets are so expensive. Yeah, they are so expensive. Um, I mean, you could. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, no, we're feeding them straight hay. And then Giovanni, he put a little bit of sweet grain. So we will um, offer the use right the for the first like 48 hours grain sometimes they won't want to eat right away they're kind of like traumatized and they're tired and they're like just want to lay down um, they'll drink water but they don't want to eat right away so the grain just kind of entices them to start eating um, 
So we'll put the ewe, when she starts showing signs of lambing, if we can catch her at that stage, we'll put her in, in a barn, in, the, in, the, in a stall. In these two corners are heat lamps. So we'll usually pack straw if it's pretty cold. We'll pack straw into these corners under the heat lamps for the lambs. You can come see. Um, and so we'll, we'll have the heat lamps there because the lamb, lambs are really vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They're not as good as cows are at staying out in the cold. Plus, I feel like ewes and lambs um, need supervision when they're first born because sometimes lambs aren't the best nursers in the beginning. Have you had that? Uh, yeah. Where you need to kind of help them latch. Yeah. yeah. And so they, I feel like it's just easier to put them in here. The ewes can also be, get stressed out with the flock because if, like if we've had it happen often where they'll lamb under their shed and then everyone will come in and she'll like want to protect her lamb and she'll kind of get nervous and freaked out about everyone being there. And then all the other ewes who are getting ready to lamb have the hormones going and they're like all curious about the new lamb and it's just like a nightmare. So... We put the, the U is usually happy to be in here by herself. How do you do that? Oh, sorry. How do you do that? How do you tear off one U from the group? So if the lamb has not been born yet, we can just like guide her with, because we don't grain them regularly, like they'll follow some sweet grain. One of us will kind of like herd her from the back and one will like kind of, coax her with grain um our older ewes know the know the deal oh my god like they don't even hesitate to come in because <laughs> they, they associate they it with like no not that i wish that would be even better <laughs> not quite that <laughs> not <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> not quite now. to that level but um but if we like they see us trying to kind of split them off so behind the tractor is like this little square pad where like we can maneuver those two gates the gate to their shed and the gate to the, where the behind the tractor and we can kind of box them in and get them into the barnyard okay. once they're in the barnyard and they see this open they'll come in okay. um or we just need to coax them a little bit with grain if the lamb happened to be barn outside like they nested outside the lambs barn outside all you have to do is pick up their lamb and go like this and she'll follow it um, she'll follow it in so we get, it, we get them in here. They actually seem to be very happy to be here, and, and it's calm, and it's quiet, and they don't have to worry about any, anybody else, and they can just focus on their lamb. And it also has really helped with bonding. So the you, I mean, the flock can be big, you know, up to 20 or 30 sheep. That's a lot of, of sheep. And so you want to make sure that before you kick the lamb with their mama back out to the flock, that they're really well bonded, and that, that lamb, they're kind of... They're kind of dumb, like in the beginning. I feel like cows are much better at this part of life. Um, but lambs, they'll like, bah, bah, and like their mom is like right here, and they can't find her or something. It's the craziest thing. I'm like, um, so, so you really want to let them bond. This has been really useful for us. It's been really beneficial for us. Let them bond. Um, when you, so first we give them each their own stall, then whenever we keep having lambs coming, we start to double them up, and that's why we put this divider. This is plenty of space for you with yeah. a lamb or you with twins even. I've Probably seen much, I've seen even smaller boxes, yeah. Um, but this seems to get us through the season. We use this stall, this, so we have four stalls that we'll divide. And then um, once they're getting a little bit bigger, um, and they're get, so we usually keep them in here for their first vaccine. So their first vaccine is at two weeks. Um, so here's like the lamb health care schedule. Um, at two weeks, so when they're first born, um, you have a couple of options. And we will give smaller lambs or lambs that look a little bit lack of energy. Some of them are really tired when they're born. And we're like, get up, get up, try to nurse. You know, don't get tired, you'll get cold, you know. Um, this is a, a drench. And it's a nutri drench, and we will. It's just. Can you explain vitamins. what a drench is? Yeah, a drench is like. Uh, <laughs> Do you want it? to demonstrate a drench? Yeah. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> you put this in the corner of their mouth, and you just pump it. So they get a lamb, a newborn lamb will get like two pumps. So this is like calcium, selenium, vitamins A, D, and E, and um, this is can be used for goats too. But we will give lambs that look a little bit tired or lethargic and lambs that maybe aren't the sharpest knife in the drawer, because sometimes they're born and you're like, oh, you're going to be in trouble, because <laughs> they're just not 
quick. You know, they're not witty. Like some lambs are like up and they're like nursing like in five minutes and, they're, and you're like, whoa, that, and then you keep track because that's the lineage you want to keep breeding, right? Yeah. So this is where we start improving our flock over time is we, cut, we keep retaining the best lambs and the best sheep over the years. And that's how we've gotten to the point where we are now. Um, but those lambs that just need a little bit extra boost, we'll give them a drench. Something, another protocol that we used to use that we don't do anymore because we don't really see the point anymore because we keep our stalls pretty clean. But some people will take betadine. I'll take betadine and put it in a cup and dip their umbilical cord in the betadine um, to just prevent infection. And I guess if you're lambing like in mud or aren't rebedding well, you know, a little bit more dirty, um, then maybe you want to do that. But if the lambs are being born or their first few days are on fresh shavings, then you're not going to deal with infection up the umbilical cord. I will add to the umbilical cord. Um, this was weird for me, but I did learn that you don't pull it, don't touch it, don't, it, like sometimes they're super long and they might be even tripping over it, but just let yeah, it, don't touch it, let That's it do its true. thing, do not pull on don't it, don't cut it, and don't cut it, <laughs> just don't think about it, because if you pull on it, you could cause complications, and it'll dry up, and it will snap off in like yeah. a couple days, so. Yeah, exactly, yeah, good point, <laughs> thanks for saying that. It was like, why is it tripping over it, is that yeah, just like yeah. so disturbing, but yeah, just leave yeah, it alone. Yeah, exactly, totally, just leave it alone. Um, so those are like the two things we might do for lambs right away. You might run into lambs that need to be bottle fed. <clears throat> if a sheep ha gets mastitis, that's only happened to us one time in 10 years. Um, or if the lamb it just cannot latch in the beginning, hopefully you get them, to, you train them and you get them to latch um, and nurse on their own. But you can just use a normal human baby bottle. Don't buy anything fancy. So this is like from the dollar, the dollar store. So you can use a normal baby bottle and you just need to make the hole bigger. So just slit it a little bit bigger. Um, and you can, if you have a milk cow, you can like use cows, fresh cow's milk. Otherwise, don't use store-bought pasteurized cow's milk. You, you're better off if you don't have raw cow's milk or sheep milk, because sometimes you can milk another sheep and use her, you know, um, you would use like a lamb replacer. Hopefully you can get colostrum. So colostrum is that first milk, right, that comes down that is super packed with nutrients and they really need that because that is the basis of their immune support for their whole life, really. They're just like human babies. Um, so likely if the lamb is not nursing on its own, you might even want to milk out your sheep and get colostrum and feed it colostrum and get it to latch. And there's all kinds of other tricks, maybe we don't have time, but all kinds of other tricks to get the lamb to latch mm -hmm. if they're not latching good. <clears throat> um, then um, at the two week mark, we give them, I didn't bring this bottle out because it has to stay refrigerated, but at our typical vaccination protocol and docking protocol for lambs, is that we will give them their first round of what's called CDNT. It's um, Clostridium dip and tetanus. <laughs> what's the second one? I don't remember. Is it diphtheria? I wanted to say, but I'm I not like sure. I feel like it's Clostridium A and D. Oh, that might be like it. Two, yeah, two strains. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's right. I think that's maybe what it is. Oh, I think it's, it's honestly, it's like the only one it's at the store. Like, you're like, yeah. you'll, you'll find it. It's just, I think it's Clostridium yeah, it's A and D. It's always called CD&T. Anyone exactly. in a food store is going to know what you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. It's like the most commonly used. Yeah. yeah. So we give them their two cc's of CD&T at two weeks. And at that two-week mark, we tag their ears. Because some of the times they start looking similar. <laughs> Um, and if they're not those ones that are the sharpest knives in the drawer, then you're like, which one is your mom? Go find your mom. Because um, you start kind of co congregating them a little bit more and more. So we tag them at two weeks so we know who's who. Um, then at four weeks is um, we will, oh, yeah, and at that two-week mark, so CD&T, their first round, um, we tag their ears and we dock their tails. So this is like an issue. Do you guys dock tails? Hair sheep, you don't have to dock tails. You don't have tails. to. Okay. Mm -hmm. So our lambs, if you notice, they look like they're bobtailed. Um, that is because we actually dock their tails, which means that we put, um, we use this little contraption. And I'll talk about this. This can be a controversial thing, but 
Um, so this is a really tight rubber band. You basically expand it, you put it around their tail. You wanna avoid, you don't wanna, for show sheep get docked so high and I'm like, is that really necessary? But we, we dock to where they're gonna have a little bob. I don't wanna get, if you get too tight up on the tail head, you can actually um, injure a tendon that will really affect their ability to like poop. So you don't wanna, yeah, to like squeeze. Um, so we don't dock super high, um, but the reason why we dock, so unlike cows and horses, when they poop, they raise their tails. They have muscles that raise their tail up. Sheep don't have that musculature. So when sheep poop, they just wag their tail back and forth. <laughs> um, and when and sheep, this breed, most sheep breeds have long tails. They're actually super long. Um, they're super woolly. Um, they're thick. They're almost like a t piece of thick tape. Um, and th when because they don't lift their tails, their their tail stays wet and dirty, and it ends up being a place where flies like to lay eggs. Um, and they can just have all kinds of problems. So typically, especially in the West, we dock tails. Um, there are other parts of the world that don't dock tails, even till today. Like my husband's cousins in Sicily don't dock tails. Um, we started doing it and we have never had any problems, so we continue to do it. So docking the tail, what it does, it, it constricts the nerve and blood flow to the tail. Um, and again, this is why it's an, a controversial issue. It's your choice. but. Um, they, you can tell that they feel it, it hurts. It's like if you put a rubber band around your finger, like there's a period where it hurts, maybe 15 minutes, and then it goes numb. And that's basically what happens to their tail. They feel it, it kind of starts to hurt, and after 15 minutes, it goes numb, and they don't feel it anymore. The tail dies, and it just drops off. Um, it usually gets buried somewhere. If I find them, I'll throw them away, but um, <laughs> they get just, yeah, worked back into the ground <laughs> somewhere in the pasture. So that's tail docking. So that all happens at two weeks. At four weeks, um, we give them their second, a booster of CD&T. So another two CCs, and then we will castrate males at that point. We use the same tool. So we don't use a, a knife on, on male, on ram lambs. So we, we will we'll band their testicles. You make, want to make sure both testicles are down there. Um, you band up high. It hurts for like 15 minutes. It, my husband feels like, like, he's like, I cannot even watch. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's laughing. Um, so yeah, it hurts for maybe 15 minutes and then it goes numb. So um, we do castrations that way. And then as soon as they're docked, they're called a weather. They're not called a ram lamb anymore. So that's where that term I have a question. Yeah. So uh, going up until those that four weeks, do you put the lamb and the mama out with everybody? Yeah. Else? So okay. at about so once they have their first round of CDT, I feel like because it's winter, it's spring, it's wet. I'm like, okay, after their first round of CD and T, they're pretty protected. Um, we all know about one and two doses now <laughs> nowadays of <laughs> things. <laughs> um, so they're pretty protected. So they I, we usually will if they will kick them out at the two week mark. Okay. Um, so. What we also do, you saw we have a big grassy yard. Um, that turns into a nursery. So if the lambs, if it's nice weather, the lambs after about five days or a week are like doing really good. They're, you can see them, they want to exercise and run around. We'll put them out during the day into the yard. Um, they're eating spring grass. The mamas, are, they're learning how to start nibbling on grass already at that, even at a week of age. Mm -hmm. um, and then we bring them all back in the barn at night. So they're with other mamas and lambs. They're not out with the big flock. They're not underneath cow hooves. Mm -hmm. And, but they're outside, you know, so we'll, so I, on my face, on my Facebook and Instagram page, I'll often talk about like our lamb nursery. So our yard turns into a lamb nursery. It drives my husband crazy because then they poop in the yard, but <laughs> come on, it's so cute. And they're like right there. Yeah. <laughs> like it's fertilizer. <laughs> yeah. The, the lawn is like something we don't agree on, but you know, that's, that's marriage. <laughs> Let it go. Um, so they, they do get kicked out. Then at about the two weeks, that's whenever we'll put them out. And of course, this is all depending on like weather and make sure they're healthy. And then you have to go and find them and catch them to give them that second booster, which is really fun. Um, so that's it. That's like the lamb protocol. Um, other issues, use that seem lethargic, you know, or use that maybe were ketotic 
or had mastitis, they're feeling not good, um, I would add like an electrolyte to their water. This is something we keep on hand. It's called Bounce Back. I'm not trying to do like publicity for these brands. You can get whatever brand you want. This is just what we have on hand. <laughs> so this is just an electrolyte supplement. Um, it's blue, so it looks funny in the, in the water bucket. But um, that is just something the vet will always say too, like especially if a you had to be treated, if she had to be, here's like sleeves, if you have to assist a birth, that's a whole nother um, feel of farm day, maybe in the spring. Yeah. Um, you know, have sleeves on hand in case you have to go in and assist a lamb to be born. Um, a vitamin B complex is something that we always keep on hand also. If, we're, if the U is, has been sick or if she had a hard birth, um, or if she got ketotic or something, I would uh, be complex, like as if we would take a B vitamin, you know, like, come on, boost yourself back. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. This is also something I wanted to point out. Oh, here's the, let me do this first. Here's the ear tagger. So you get like little tags. You have special markers that won't rub off. Don't use a Sharpie. It'll rub off in like a month. Mm -hmm. So you have special ear tag um, pens air tagger our system instead of using a number system to keep track of our sheep we use a color system so our sheep all get names and then and this is just our personal way um, and then the color indicates the the year they were born mm -hmm. so if you look out and you see all the different colors that's a different generations of, of sheep mm -hmm. from the farm um, this is a, a lamb a lamb tube so if you have a lamb that is not nursing on the mama it's having a hard time. It's not um, taking the bottle. You've like tried all the tricks of the trade and they, you might have to tube them. So this is a lambing tube. You literally have to get this down into their esophagus and you can like force the colostrum or the milk down into their stomach. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have a question on that. When, yeah. So we had baby goats yes. around and whenever we had to tube them, there's a process of tubing them so that you can make sure that you're in the esophagus, in the esophagus instead not, of the lungs. Yes. Can you talk about that? Yes. So the trachea is the air tube, right? And the esophagus is the food tube. The trachea is ribbed and it's harder. The esophagus, um, if you've ever slaughtered a, chicken. Slaughter, right, slaughtered a chicken or any animal. I mean, one thing I would just say, let me just put this out there. If you ever have an animal die, necropsy it, like cut it open, look at it, like look at all of its organs and stuff and see what everything, how everything's connected. I've, I think necropsy is so cool. You can learn a lot about why they died too. Um, anyway, the trachea is ribbed, the esophagus is smooth and really um, soft. And so when you're putting the tube down, you wanna go slow um, and you want, you, you can feel right up under their chin, the tube, you wanna feel for the tip. And you want to, and if you ever don't feel the tip, it's going down the trachea because you won't be able to palpate. You can't palpate the tube inside the trachea because the trachea is hard. Mm -hmm. But you can palpate the tip in the esophagus. So as long as you can palpate it all the way down, it's going down the right tube. That's the way I learned mm -hmm. from our vet. Um, so a ruminant animal, it will have a valve that is called the forgetting the name of the valve. Anyway, so you know how um, a ruminant animal has um, the rumen, is, which digests f forages, right? So when a lamb or a calf is born, there's a valve that closes off the rumen. So it bypass, so their food bypasses the rumen and goes straight into the abomasum, which is the stomach that's kind of like our stomach. It's mm -hmm. the acidic one. It takes like liquid stuff. <laughs> um, and so you also want to be careful that you are going gentle enough to not damage that valve or get past that valve. So you just go slow. And the lamb usually is feeling pretty bad if you're having to do this, so they're not going to fight you. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, into the abomasum. You don't want to. Another thing, um, what closes that valve is when the calf or the lamb stretches their neck up. So it's important that when you bottle feed, so if you're bottle feeding the lamb, um, like this, <laughs> or even level, it's not activating that valve. And some of the milk can get into the rumen, which you don't want it to. Um, 
If the lamb, as soon as the lamb stretches its chin up like this, it closes the valve to the rumen. So you want to make sure anytime you're feeding or whatever that you're that they're stretching their neck up oh, um, to make sure it goes into the right stomach. <laughs> so yeah. Then as soon as they stop nursing, you know, as soon as they eat forage, then it, the valve opens. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, oh, and a second use of this really important because this has happened to us like two or three times. This can also be used as a lamb enema. Oh. Yeah, to dual purpose. So like okay. some, some especially like newer mamas, um, I think older mamas are better about keeping their lambs clean. A newer mama might not lick her lamb as much. Um, and sometimes lambs, I don't know why, maybe they try eating hay too soon, or I don't know what's going on, but sometimes they'll get constipated and they can get septic really fast. Um, so if you see their little poop dried up and like not going because their tails are long like right or yeah. acting like they're hurting like their stomach hurts um yeah like they can get sick really fast so um what i, I love our vet because he's like all about these cool like <laughs> tricks so you take the lamb feeding tube and you get i i use a mason jar and i put um warm salt water like warm, yeah, warm salt water. And you can literally, see there's a hole here, two holes. So you can put this in to their, um, to the anus and you can literally take a big syringe, speaking of. Um, so there's a couple more things I wanna show you on this table. So you can take a bigger syringe and, uh, oh, not this has the wrong kind of lid, anyway. You would take the syringe and you would just draw up that warm salt water and just shoot it into their colon. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that'll help flush them out if they're a little bit constipated. And sometimes you might have to do that for a few days. We've had to do that. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure why that happens. If they also get like some kind of a, a, like a coccidiosis or other things that baby animals get easily, this is another way you can just help them you know, clean out. Um, so the lamp, the feeding tube can serve as, as an enema, an enema tube. Yeah. So, so you maybe, might want to ask your question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we'll just start over. Yeah. So, um, just ready? wondering, okay. okay. Yeah. Just wondering where on the animal to put, to um, do like sub, subcutaneous and intramuscular. Yes. Yeah. Injection. Okay. So, this, so subcutaneous, the easiest place to do it on sheep is in the fold of the front of the forearm. So it's the easiest place to grab. So a subcutaneous injection, I'll show you on my arm. Um, you want to lift the skin. <laughs> this is kind of weird looking. So you take, my yeah. Like you so the first to. three, so the first, you use your three fingers and you want what's called, you want to tint the skin. So you make it like a teepee. So you like take your three fingers and you tint it like this. Does that hurt? No. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, so you want to make a little pocket, like literally a tint. And then you want to put the tip of your needle into that pocket and you inject it there. That's subcutaneous. And it's the easiest way to do it with your first three fingers like that. If you just do two fingers, you have more of a chance of putting the needle all the way through the other side. So if you use the right, yeah. totally, yeah. me too. Stuff the three finger, so the three finger tent and then put it underneath the skin. The intramuscular medications, you don't, they're not the normal ones you have to use a lot. So I can't even think of what you need to give intramuscular. Sometimes like an oxy, like a hormone, like oxytocin or something you need to give intramuscularly. Um, and in that case, you would do it, um, well, it depends. If it's a sheep that's not going to go to harvest, like a female maybe that you might not eat or not too worried about the meat quality. So a good intramuscular is the, is the butt, right? It's the best case to avoid any bony structures. But you, you ruin that piece of meat, like all the way through to where your needle went. Oh, yeah. Um, and then, so the best place is in the neck. And so they have their spine, but they also have the jugular vein. So what you do is you draw a triangle from their scapula. They have great pictures on Google yeah. it. Google like cow injection site. And so it's like this triangle between the, the jugular, um, the scapula, and the spine. And that's a safe place and it's not going to interfere with the meat quality. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what they would teach you like in beef quality assurance like workshops and stuff. Um, so that are the two, those are the places to give. I think for lambs, it's easy just to curl their arm up 
and just make a fold in the skin and give them an IM, interme- um, sorry, I, Q, sub Q um, to, for their vaccines. Older U's, you can just, if somebody holds them or if you have them restrained, you can just lean over and tint and go like right, right, right behind their forearm. That's where the loose skin is easy to find. Um, okay, hoof trimming. So hoof trimming needs to be done with your U's about once a year, every other year at the very minimum. Their hooves get pretty long. These things are super sharp. You can get them at Murdoch's or a feed store or whatever. Um, but you want to let someone show you how to trim a hoof before you try. You don't want to get, <laughs> you don't want to trim, you don't want to hurt them because it's sometimes hard to see like what part actually needs trimming and what part you shouldn't injure because it's soft. Um, but we had to really keep up with foot hoof trimming with um, the muddiness of the spring this year. That was an issue. Um, so this is, a sh- this is like your best sharps container. So you know how like at the doctor's office they had like the hazard container for sharp, like a, a laundry detergent box is like the best. It's the perfect size yeah. to protect yourself and your children or whoever from needles, use needles. Um, and, see it's, and it holds a lot. And, um, and then also you're protecting your like trash people. So anyone who's handling your garbage once this is full isn't going to hurt themselves. Like never just throw a needle into your normal trash bag because you're putting someone else at risk for getting punctured or yourself (laughs) or whoever takes out the trash. Um, So I learned from someone to use old laundry detergent because it's thick plastic, you know, and it'll, they, it can't puncture through. So we always have an old laundry detergent bottle in our like medicine cabinet, and that's for sharps, use sharps. This is for sheep, all you need for as far as any kind of halter or restraining um, device. <laughs> you, a lot of people for big operations, they'll have a chute, you know, they'll like, like a cattle chute, but for a little one for sheep. <laughs> Um, But really, like, you can pretty much be thrifty and use this for almost anything. So this is called a rope halter. And um, so the part that your tail is attached to, directly to, goes under their chin. Okay, and this goes, like, behind their ears, and this goes, like, over their forehead. It's all connected, so you have to kind of, like, get it kind of set to where you're able to kind of halter them and then you cinch it under their chin, okay, and it tightens around here. Um, If you ever need to restrain, so we've had a couple times where like a ewe doesn't want to let their lamb nurse, that can happen. Sometimes new mamas are like, what in the world are they trying to do? Get them away from me, you know? And sometimes you might have, if you you don't have someone there to to hold the sheep and restrain the sheep while someone else or you try to get the lamb latched, um, you might have to restrain use a rope to restrain her. So you would use just a rope halter and you can tie him to the, the door or whatever and keep and put her up against like flat up against the wall so that you know you can get the lamb to nurse. So all you really need for restraining really is a rope halter for sheep. Um, also if you need if they're being super stubborn and or if you need to put them in a trailer and they don't want to go or or whatever. A rope halter is really all you need hopefully. Sheep don't lead from the front. So they're not, they hate it. Um, they're not like horses, they're not trained, or even like our milk cows trained, she's halter broke, but it's not natural for them to follow a halter, so they really don't like it. But um, if you have to restrain them, that's all you need. Um, and that's like pretty much all I have here, I think. It covers like the, the basics. Yeah. Stuff always happens. Like in every year something happens that never happened before. So you're always learning new. You're coming across a new um, disease or a new like pathology or, or like I have no idea. Like our, our blind pig, I have no idea. Like never had a, blind, a pig go blind before. So I, I wanted just to show you all I have a couple cards. I... If y'all actually, oh, so this is something that happened. A makeshift uh, (laughs) cast. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so this is what I'm saying. Like, he does the craziest things that always work. So we had a sheep this summer or this spring, a lamb, break her leg. Um, It was obvious it was broken at the very distal um, piece. And... um, we don't know what happened to her, but Giovanni splinted it with a piece of PVC pipe and duct tape, literally. And um, 
<laughs> and she walked on it for, we had to open it and like check a couple times, make sure it wasn't getting infected or anything because it was so muddy this spring. Um, and you wouldn't have even, you won't even tell who she was because she's not even limping or walking funny anymore. So there's all, <laughs> that was the first time you've ever had to split a lamb's leg, but you just never know um, what can happen. But um, there's always solutions. And sometimes you don't, you know, your vet is like really your best friend. If you make a good relationship with your vet, then a lot of times a lot of things can happen with a consult over the phone. Um, and uh, yeah, so <clears throat> I, I have like, um, so this is our, our card for our farm. It's the same phone number. But this is um, a little consulting business that I opened a few years ago when I started getting a lot of requests for new people who were moving into our area wanted um, consultation about uh, how to set up like a paddock or a shelter or a fence. Like what kind of fence do I use? I want to raise pigs or sheep. Um, and so I started a little side thing of doing on the farm consults with people. Mostly what, I, what it's been is just helping people get set up. Um, like someone wants to start doing rotational grazing because they don't like how their pastures look um, and they want to learn how they do that. And so I can also do um, remote sent soil analyses um, for people and give you an idea of your what kind of soils you have and how to manage those soils. So there, I have a little consulting thing that I do on the side, but I'm also, especially since y'all came and spent like three hours here, um, if y'all get started like next year, the next year, whatever, if you call me and say, hey, I was at your farm for the that tour, um, I will be happy to just talk with you on the phone and answer any questions. A lot of times people who have bought lambs from us like to keep our sizes down, our flock size down, we'll sell lambs every year. Um, we won't keep them all. And um, people who buy our lambs, I try to teach them as much as I can, especially if they're just doing it for the first time. Um, but then I'll, I'm happy to like text and people ask questions and we talk and get started like just on the phone. So, <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I will say too, one of the like really helpful resources was the University of Wyoming um, sheep and goat extension. Oh, they, awesome. and then they're like pairing with the University of Idaho sheep and goat extension, and they do like lambing webinars every spring to like oh, make sure. Awesome. And you can like go through your kit and make sure that you have everything. Yeah. So just in case you like forgot to stock up on something. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Were you gonna say something? Do okay. Yeah. So that's I, that was awesome too because that was like went into more depth of. Too, they'll go into like what happens when you have a prolapsed you or something right. like, or you have to assist in a birth, like stuff we can't really cover here. Yeah. You just, so, so yeah, much. that, th like, go to their website and their Facebook pages and they have an email so newsletter. That's yeah, a great they're resource. incredible. Yeah, I, I, I admire them a lot. So. Yeah. And um, yeah. well, Wyoming, I mean, they know sheep. They know sheep. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Anna yeah, you're welcome. you're welcome. You're yeah. welcome.